My name's Sharon Richardson. I see a few familiar faces from yesterday. Thank you for coming again. I like you a lot. Uh, I've got 10 years' experience with SharePoint. Six was spent at Microsoft from the very early days when it was Tahoe through to being involved in the, the development of the current product. Actually, it's soon to not be current product anymore because the next version's coming out next month. Last four years, I've been an independent consultant. Very much doing the same thing. I tend to do the more practical side of SharePoint. What can it actually do? Where are its limits? And focusing on where are the good sides of it, but also where are the potential rabbit holes that you can fall down? I typically focus on getting as much as you can out of the box. So minimal code, if possible, minimal customization. And the session today, there'll be no Visual Studio. I'll not be cracking open Active Directory. If you're looking for that kind of deep technical stuff, I don't want you to leave, but you know, go to another session because you're not going to see it here. It's all going to show you stuff we can do inside the browser to improve search. The session I'm going to deliver today is based on a workshop I delivered for Microsoft uh, just over two years ago now when they introduced what was an infrastructure update for SharePoint 2007. It introduced new capabilities, particularly federated search for SharePoint, where you could do a search across multiple different indexes and bring those results back together on a single page and some search improvements. And so I did some workshops as a part of that release, partly because there was a huge feedback that, quite frankly, that SharePoint search sucks, that it's rubbish, that it just doesn't find anything, that it's not very good. And I've seen quite a few deployments that have really customised the search. What's been interesting, I'm still seeing it, is they customise it before they ever use it. And I always think you should at least use something and be sure it's not good enough before you start changing it, because search is quite a tricky beast. It's not all about technology. There's a lot of people parts to it. How we search can influence what we find and the information that we're searching across. And that's how this session came into being. It looks at all three areas. The question I still always get off everybody is we want enterprise search inside our organization to be just like searching Google on the internet. It's a completely understandable requirement. <coughs> Everyone knows how to search Google. Everyone's gotten used to what Google serves up. They want that speed. They want that breadth of coverage. I can search for anything. Stuff comes back. It's interesting. It's, I see less of a demand for it in the last eh, 12 to 18 months now than I did maybe two to three years ago. I think the real-time stuff like Twitter and Facebook updates has perhaps changed things a little bit because people increasingly find it's harder to get what you want on that first page. It was a given. Certainly for me, four or five years ago, you searched, it was on the first page. It was, it was phenomenal. It was brilliant for the internet. But even now on the internet, I'm finding, unless you go to a type of search, if I'm looking for information, a bit of a shocker for starting with Wikipedia, if I'm honest, and seeing what's there and what links are on the page and then mining from there out. So it is changing, but it's an understandable but a requirement I still see. I spend a lot of time explaining why you can't have Google inside your organization. And these are just some of the issues. For starters, you'd probably want a data center because it means you're going to index everything that you can possibly find in the world, and that takes a lot of indexing. You know, Google has a great indexing optimization team, you know, and it's true. They didn't come up with this. They thought, mm, how can we improve search? Oh, I know, PageRank has a great algorithm. We'll create it. We'll get it sorted. Job done. Sit back. Let the search results roll. Of course not. You know, they're constantly tweaking those algorithms, constantly improving them and adopting them as the technology changes. And it partly feeds with the second because you know, search engine optimization is an industry that arose out of internet search. How can you get the wrong results onto the first page? Not necessarily what the person's looking for, but what you want them to find. I have to confess, I'm not a huge fan of search engine optimization companies. They can say they're a white hat, not a black hat, to the heart's content. It still is about them putting their results on the home page, regardless of what you're actually searching for. So it's this constant rolling between somebody optimizing to an algorithm and then the algorithm adjusting. And you don't really need that inside an organization. This fourth point here, content that wants to be found, it's a fundamental difference between internet search and internal search. If you've got a website, you've got a vested interest for people to be able to find that website. You'll do what you have to. Enter the search engine optimization companies. You know, they will help you make sure that your site can be found. There's a lot of work goes into that. I rarely see an organization that's got a team dedicated to making content want to be found. That's not to say they haven't got some roles in place, because often you'll find records managers, archivists, taxonomy experts, but they're not always about wanting content to be found. That's a bigger role as well. There are often legislative requirements. They're capturing information and making sure it's retained 
for the correct life cycle, which is another bow to their string. It, it, there's another requirement there. So getting content that wants to be found can be quite tricky inside an organisation. Because there are different types of content, formal documents, much, much easier to manage than the informal knowledge, the, the opinions, the commentary that goes on in email. That's a trickier bucket. The next two are somewhat related, and again, a big challenge that's different internally to externally. Open access to everything. You know, typically there's two types of security if you're searching on the internet. It either can be found by everyone, or it's behind a paywall, it's behind a subscription wall. So you might get a summary, but you won't get any further. The Google doesn't have to care who you are. No search engine, I should say. I'm saying Google, Microsoft probably tried to bing it a lot at this time. But it's true of all internet engines. They don't really care who you are. They don't really care what you're looking for. It's not their job. They'll serve up the results. You can either get into them or you can't if you've got the right accounts. Internally, that's a little bit more important. You know, there are security concerns to consider. You don't want results being served up that people shouldn't see. So those security roles, that changes. And you'll typically want to know who's doing the searching as well. Very few organisations say, yep, open everything, don't even bother with logging in, who cares, let's just let everybody search for stuff. I don't see that a lot in organisations. And then the final one is perhaps the biggest challenge of all. When you search the internet, the internet search engines really don't need to care what you're searching for or what you do with what you find. They're serving up results, off you go. Internally, it doesn't stop there. It's about serving up information to perform a task, an activity, a process, to do something. So it does matter what you find, and it does matter which result you choose, and it does matter how you then use that information. These are all challenges that really make what, what seems such a perfectly simple and reasonable request make our internal search like Google actually very difficult. This was a beautiful statistic that came up a couple of years ago. Apparently, unfortunate for the unlucky 35 each day, they'll get declared dead even though they're perfectly living and breathing. Uh, understandable data input error. Oop, God, they didn't die, sorry. Uh, you had a headache. It is, I'm, just, I'm not quite sure what they're doing wrong, but you can imagine there's a lot of people in America. 35 is actually a tiny, tiny percentage. If you're doing your Six Sigma studies, it probably comprises to Six Sigma expertise in terms of the accuracy of your data retention. So errors happen, and you need a process to deal with that that, again, internet doesn't really care about. This quote, I really feel sorry, I, should, I need to remember who made this quote. It wasn't me. I'd love to claim it. It came from somebody else first. There's an element of truth there. There is. You take any food packaging, trust me. I mean, you know what it's like. They're colour-coded now. Oh, God, there's a lot of red on this one. It's not going to be good. Oh, green. It's going to taste horrible. Um, you know, there's so much information put on food, way more than you'll ever see in a typical corporate document. And again, that's because there's a lot of legislation. <laughs> there's a lot of lawsuits hiding behind not having that information there. Again, big challenge because there will be a percentage of information inside the organisation, that actually is very true. You know, any government agencies, if you're dealing with people, you're holding information about people, well, there's a lot of legislation around that. There's the Data Protection Act just to start with, along with all the other stuff. But that's only one part. There's also a lot of other information. And God forbid were we all required to make our documents have as many properties against them as a packet of crisps. The thing is, though, is classification is very, very difficult. For starters, different users have got very different needs and very different definitions. I always remember when I first joined Microsoft, they'd put you on an induction training course and go through the acronyms that you were now going to live and breathe as long as... Sorry? Oh, ah, uh, thank you. I forgot to mention at the start, Windows very kindly, on my behalf, has downloaded and installed some updates that it wants to restart, which would be great, but it did it yesterday as well and it took half an hour to restart. So. I'm making it wait until after the presentation, but thank you and please prompt me because it'll ask me again in 15 minutes' time. It's still not restarting. Where was I? So, yes, different users have very different needs. SME, you know, small, medium enterprise, you know, it can also mean, it can mean an awful lot of different things to different people. WIMP's one of my favourite ones, you know, Windows icons, menus, pointers. Or so I thought until I checked on Wikipedia and it turns out there's about five different things. Some are, it's pull down menus and it's mice. And then it's menus, but it's not, it's pointers. So, is it menus and pointers or is it pull down menus? And <laughs> so, different definitions. Now, who decides? Who's the right person to make that decision? Reasons and incentives really, really difficult inside an organisation. It's not that people don't want to classify data. Most people would happily. It's time. 
you know, it's that trade-off. Do I make sure everything I've just finished work on is correctly bucketed and organised and classified and able to be discovered? Or I do, do I do the other ten things that I need to get done by the end of today? There's always a trade-off. And this is an interesting one. It's something that the internet can keep doing with a broad breadth, can find stuff, but internally, classification benefits reduce the more content you have. You know, it's great if you're classifying a certain types of documents, show me all my patient records, because you get more and more and more. You need more than just that phrase, because that gets you millions. What's the next level down? How do you keep refining those results down? It gets hard. And the final bit that's quite tricky is that terminology keeps changing too. We've got phrases that we use now that we didn't use a couple of years ago, we didn't use five years ago. Goodness knows what we'll be talking about in two years' time. iPad probably didn't return a lot of search results six months ago. God help us now, nobody can stop talking about it. And in a year's time, you'll be swamped, you know, or, or using one, let's put it. <laughs> so terminology keeps coming into our vocabulary and changing. Uh, about, again, it was about two years ago, the Museum of Modern Art did a test of their displays. They've got lots of art. They're a, they're a museum of art. You'd expect them to have lots of art. And it was how do they optimise the displays so that when visitors come and view the artworks, they have a journey. You know, they view the correct works in the right order. They get the most out of the experience. Because all the artwork, understandably, is well classified. It's, it's an area of expertise. That seems quite a defined boundary to work within. Classified, catalogued, job done. They ran a test audience through the museum and asked them to classify the artworks, you know, just to use phrases that came to mind, keywords. If they were tagging them on Flickr, what would they use? And 80% of the terms they used were not in their catalogue. And equally, 80% of the terms in the catalogue were words that they, even, they wouldn't know how to pronounce, let alone apply it to a term of art. And it was just because art experts will classify art in a very different way to a layman. I mean, I'm no expert in art. I'm no expert in too much, really. It's like wine. A wine expert will come out with all sorts of weird things that taste like iron filings to me. I think, God, why would you want to drink a glass of wine that tastes of iron filings? It's not my idea of a good evening. But obviously there's an expertise there, but that's a different vocabulary. So it's something to always bear in mind on the human aspect. And then there's how we actually search. We don't tend to think about, well, what are people doing the search in the first place for? Are they looking for specific answers to get something done very quickly? That's a timely search. And typically a good enough answer, as long as it's accurate, will do. Or are they researching something? Are they preparing a report, a paper, a presentation? That's a more leisurely search. Often there'll be a lot of serendipity there. Oh, I didn't even know that existed. Now where does that take me down search? Now I know that. What else don't I know? And you go on a more exploratory journey. Different search habits. And that leads to the next point, you know, do you need to find the answer, the one accurate answer versus an answer will do, a good enough answer will do, versus you need absolutely everything. If you're any kind of records management role, you need to find everything. If you're doing a search for a legal case, you need everything to be found. If you need to just get something done, often an answer will be good enough. There's also the, are you looking for yourself versus looking for someone else? You know, when again, back to, I can also use Microsoft as some examples, because I used to, I was one of the early ones in SharePoint. So in the early days, very few people had any knowledge of SharePoint. I could do a search for SharePoint because I was allowed into the specification server, so I could go delving and seeing what we were working on for the next product. But equally, I'd be asked by somebody, Sharon, what's the latest presentation I should use? What, are, what industry presentations have we got? I'd go and search for them because I could match the right terms to flush up the right presentation, whereas they would probably type in SharePoint public sector and, it, and see what comes back and hope that it was relevant. So often, you're not even searching for yourself. You're searching to present something to someone else. And this trend, I mentioned this yesterday as well for those who are here, we're seeing a real trend now where you go for a much broader search. In the past, you tried to refine your search as accurately as you could get to what you were looking for to reduce the number of results that come back. Now we're seeing that really change. It's much more about give me a broad search and let me then filter. And we're finding that's a much more accurate way of getting to the end result because you can then filter. If the filter doesn't work, you can step back up and back down and move that slider up and down until you get to where you want. That's easier than constantly starting a fresh search all over again and going, well, well, that didn't work. Off we go again. It's get everything and narrow it down that funnel. It's a different type of behaviour. But that's all around people. That's all around information. There's no kidding that SharePoint 2007 does have some limitations. Well, it has one, really, and that is the indexing process itself. 
Within an instance of SharePoint, there are ways around where you can have more than one indexing server, but the end result is not pretty. So the reality is, for most solutions, there are with one indexing server. It's the ultimate bottleneck. You can have multiple query servers, so lots and lots of people can be querying the servers at once. You can have massive data stores underneath to get to a lot of content indexed, but for everything you're indexing, it goes through one server. And to give an example, this is from Microsoft's own guidelines, their capacity planning guidelines. They run a test to prove that SharePoint can index up to 50 million documents. It can actually go way over 50 million documents. It's not the volume of documents to index that's the problem. This is the, uh, the, the, the setup for the testing environment that was done for this. So you can see 10 million items in SharePoint sites, 15 million items in file shares, web pages, people profiles, documents. Now the point in brackets, auto-generated, is really important because that means a random algorithm just creating two megabyte word documents, which means they're not going to be that representative of a real world scenario because the vocabulary is not going to be as broad or as complex or as interlinked in the real world. So you're seeing a kind of a best case here. And then a million metadata properties. That all turned into around about 600 gigabytes of content. That generated a 100 gigabyte sized index. That's a chunky index. It's actually not the end of the world. That'd be quite normal. It's the time. To do all that, the full crawl took 35 days. Exactly. And that's based on getting around about 15 documents per second. Now, I've played around with various different indexing scenarios now. And you can get more than 15 documents per second. I've seen it go up to around about 30, 32 on optimized hardware. But you can do the maths. If you've got 20 million documents, break it down. 32 documents per second still takes a long time. And what we're also seeing is most of the organizations I talk to that are looking for large-scale search are way beyond 600 gigabytes of content. They're into terabytes. They're often into four, five, ten terabytes of content. And all that content has to funnel through one indexing server. And that is a real problem in terms of the bottlenecks. So that's one of the limitations. You can get there, and once that full crawl's built, once you're onto incremental updates where it's just re-indexing modified content, much, much quicker. Uh, I think I've got, yeah, I've got it here. You know, if it 2% changes, an incremental crawl will take about 8 to 12 hours, but that's still overnight, and that's only 2% of content. Actually, the percentage is probably not far off the mark. We tend to think our content's a lot more dynamic than it is. The reality is you have a very, very small percentage that's very, very dynamic. It's the current stuff people are working on. Most content, after a very short period of time, becomes static. So the percentage change is, is not far off the mark. But you're still looking at overnight for that kind of number, which is not a huge amount. So what do we see different with SharePoint 2010? One of the big, big changes with 2010, I'm not going to demo this change today, I'm going to demo some of the tweaks for 2007, but so that you know it's coming down the line as the product's released, is the ability to partition the indexing server, which means you can now have multiple indexing processes running at the same time. Different virtual servers, I'm assuming virtual servers, everyone I talk to virtualizes their deployment these days, but they each can be looking after different data sets and then in parallel be indexing. You can imagine how much that's going to speed up the full crawl process, let alone the incremental crawl. I saw numbers from Microsoft's own internal deployment at the conference last year and it was at least 60% faster. It was a real jump. Uh, and it's going to be how you architect it as to how much benefit you gain. But that alone is a biggie. If you have got deployments that are on 2007 and you're starting to think about upgrade plans to 2010, Quite honestly, if the client's licensed for 2010, the first thing I'd be looking to do is get at least the indexes running on the newer version. Because all of a sudden, <laughs> I spotted it this time. Thank you. Uh, all of a sudden, you've got an immediate improvement. Without the user having any change, they can still carry on working with their current SharePoint sites, but indexing suddenly gets a lot, lot better. The other part, 2010, is enabling this trend, this idea of having that broad search and then filtering results. Thanks to things like the metadata service, the tagging, the extracting the properties automatically, and then displaying them down the left side of results page, you get that. I just do a very, very broad search, and then I start filtering off the tags that are there. Obviously, if you go to the next level up and take on fast, it will do things like auto-classification and start to promote additional information that you don't think you need to classify by. So it takes it 
to another level. But even the basic SharePoint search, you get this new ability to do the refined results down the left-hand side. If I've got time, I'll fire up the demo just for anyone that hasn't seen it. But the actual live stuff, I'm going to focus on 2007. You can just see here on these couple of screenshots, I've just done result type by PowerPoint, result by author Jim Gray, and it goes straight down to one PowerPoint from my massive 65 results that I found when I did the original search. There's not a lot of content in my index, but you, you can see the benefits. Okay, how are we doing? Not too bad. I'm not going to go into the live demo yet. I'm just going to talk through, and then I'll do some actual tweaks to show it in action. These are just some simple tips and tricks that can help improve relevance if, you're, if you've not tried them before. The first one is actually how you plan your site hierarchies in SharePoint 2007. 2007 has got a number of different algorithms that it uses to calculate relevance. One of them is URL depth. And if I'm honest, it's not my favourite because it causes all sorts of problems because it's quite influential. We look at this very basic hierarchy here. We've got top level of the site collection, the internet, the homepage when you go there. We've got three top level sites then of services, teams, community. Unsurprisingly, we've then got various different sites under those. So teams, we've got finance, we've got IT. This community site could be a complete open forum, something you're encouraging, a community of practice, a discussion area, a let's all gel and be happy families inside the organisation. It's something that's open to everyone. You want to make it very, very visible. They're often ex you know, accessible from the homepage of the internet. They're high up in the hierarchy. You're building morale. You're getting people to participate and share knowledge. All excellent stuff. But its URL is a lot, lot shorter than everybody's team sites. So if you do a generic search, and there's a bit of a ding-dong going on in a community forum around, I don't know, next version of SharePoint or update to developer framework, from the IT perspective, the community stuff's going to trump their own team site because it's got a shorter URL. It's a simple little thing, but it can really affect results. So whilst visually, from a usability perspective, always have these sorts of sites very accessible from the home page, you can be cheeky and create a separate hidden arm, and so you drop it down a couple of levels. Lengthen its URL so that it's still highly visible in terms of how you design the user interface, but the indexing will automatically lower the relevance. There's a couple of tips in the interface to help, and I'll show you those too in terms of authoritative sites. <coughs> Another area to help, scopes. I'll rush through these because these are easier to show. Scopes help you narrow the search. They're not as good as what's coming up through 2010 with all the metadata fun, but they are a step in the right direction. Search scopes don't speed up the presentation of search results because they only filter the results afterwards. If I do a search for information in SharePoint 2007 and select a scope of the IT site, it'll still go against the whole index and bring it all back, but then it'll pick up my scope and throw everything away and then narrow down. So be aware, it doesn't speed up the results because it does a generic query first, but it then narrows down. It's not as slick as the new interface, but it is a way of refining search results. Two other aspects are really to try and help people avoid searching in the first place. This isn't something you'll see on the internet because there's no benefit to internet search engines. They want you to search. But inside an organisation, actually, searching could be argued as a waste of time. The analysts will come up with lost hours of productivity spent to searching. I'm, I'm a little bit pessimistic at those calculations because, you know, we, we're not programmed to just go like Dilbert style for eight hours of the day and not move from our desks. You know, it's part of the working environment. But there is definitely a gain to avoiding searching in the first place. Using the features like the alerts and the RSS feeds can help promote information as it changes. If I'm involved in an active project, if I'm leading that project, I, it's probably important for me to be notified. So setting up an alert on that site or that document library or even a very specific document means I just get told when it's changed automatically. If I'm uh, overseeing a number of projects and I'm just keeping an eye on things, that's where news feeds, RSS feeds can really help. I can scan the page, I can see what's the latest updates. Don't necessarily need to act on them. It's the, it's the difference between alerts and RSS. Alert is just that, alert you, get you to do something. RSS is when I've got time, I'm going to quickly scan what's going on and, and check, do I need to be doing anything? And then there's another feature, best bets, which is really about targeting stuff. It's a manual link, in effect. It's a manual result. It's saying, when people enter a search about this, I want this result to be at the top or in the sidebar or visible. 
Best bet's typically used for keywords. So if somebody searches for IT, you know, show a best bet of the IT team site, that makes sense. But you can also cheat and put things like search tips in there, which can also help. If you're searching for this, have you thought about searching for that? There are ways of guiding people and improving their search because they just often don't know. It's being aware of what's useful and out there to find. And, oh, oh, hang on a sec, wait. If I do it too much, oh, thank you. Very, very quickly, this can be useful if you have got metadata in 2007. And I know there's been at least one session during this week that did the tag-driven tag architecture in 2007. Managed properties let you map different metadata together so that customer might be represented with one term in a system. It might be cust underscore ID, it might be customer as a column in SharePoint, it might be account number in another system, but they all mean the same thing. The use of managed properties say all of these we understand mean customer. And then you can create scope so that you can target that managed property. So again, it's another way of, of cheating and refining those results down. Federated search, really big new one. This is the ability to present results alongside. Has anybody here not seen federated search before? Or has everyone seen it? You see, quite a few haven't. It's one of the most useful features in 2007. We'll show you this one. But it's type in one search, bring results back from different locations. It doesn't give you a single set of results. And that, to be honest, is a good thing. Because each of those different locations will have their own relevance ranks, their own algorithms for determining what matters. And it might be different types of content. So if you see on the screen here, I've done search for Ray Aussie. These are the results coming back from my intranet, all three of them. Here I'm getting some results back from live search, and here I'm seeing some photos from Flickr. Different types of content, different sources on one page. I didn't have to step out to the internet to do a second search. And then finally on the slides, and then I'm going to go into the demo, is people. We, we, never, we tend to underestimate the value of just going and asking someone. There's this absolute thing of, oh, we should all just ask the system. Not necessarily, you know, if you find the person with the knowledge, get it out of their head. I've, always, I've often used this approach in, so well, that last bit doesn't show very well at all. This is for KM systems, you know, where is the knowledge? There's that very structured information, there's that commentary, the content in files. There is still a huge amount in our heads, and that's where it should stay, in my opinion. You know, a lot of attempts to get it out of your head, you lose the context, you know. Some stuff, you need to have that conversation. So don't underestimate things like the use of my sites, profiles, getting people to put a bit of information in about themselves to start a conversation. One live example I can give of this, and it's a little bit of an old one now. Again, back at Microsoft, I was just doing, I was updating all my collaboration decks. It was one of the areas that I specialised in. I thought, oh, I could do with some fresh research, some fresh images, something fresh. So I did a search, a search collaboration. And it turned out there was a whole team in the Xbox group, you can see where this was going, that was specialising in collaboration because they were looking at it from a massive multiplayer online game perspective. And they got presentations titled Collaboration using the Xbox. I was like, oh, oh, I've got my example. But I found someone then and got involved in a whole separate research project I would never have found otherwise because it wouldn't have entered my head to have typed in collaboration and Xbox. The two were not in the same domain for me, but they were for someone else. And it was finding that person made all the difference. So don't underestimate the people search. Okay, I'm rushing a little bit because I know it's only got half an hour, but I'm just going to show you some of those tips inside of 2007. Now, again, just like uh, for those of you who were yesterday for my session, this is not a canned demo. There's no Contoso here. There's nothing hiding in the background. It's a pretty vanilla installation of SharePoint 2007 with a little bit of content. So I'm going to show you exactly what you can do out of the box. One of the simplest things can be to enhance the search box that you see at the top by default. Out of the box, you'll have all sites and people search up here. But it is really simple to just add some extra scopes. So here, I've got some top-level tabs, media, projects, teams, that then drop down and create some sites. All I've done, oh, you little thing, I'm not going to cry when that kills itself later. Let's bring that back up. All I've done here is created scopes for each of those threads of sites and made them available in the drop-down. So if people know they need to get something out of media, select media, and it'll narrow the results straight down to content only within the media section. Really easy to do. I'll just quickly show you. If you go to your site collection, and you do need to be at the top level, go into site settings, modify all site settings. 
Over here on the right, you'll have your site collection administration. If you go into search scopes here, this is where you configure that. You get these display groups, and the default one is the search drop-down, which will have all sites people. I've added in media teams and projects. I just click on it. You can see here, it will list me all the available scopes. You can just check and uncheck those boxes, and that will make them visible in that drop-down. One tiny little... I'm not going to overcook our, the user interface, but one thing that can confuse a lot of people is I don't know if it comes through on the slide, but this bottom one here is greyed out. And if they're not selected, for whatever reason, they're greyed out. And that can put people off and think, well, it's not available. It is. It's just, it's just greyed out for some reason. If you check the box, it then enables it in black. It's a silly little thing, but the number of people that think, well, if it's greyed, I can't use it because that's quite normal. Things greyed out, they're inaccessible. So ignore the greying out. If I pick it, add it in, click OK. Now if I go back to the home, the thing is, if I do the drop down, and now I think, hang on, I just clicked OK and it's not showing. Don't worry, I don't know why it's set up that way, but it waits for the next update on the index. So it'll appear in about five or ten minutes' time. So it's a bit of a gotcha because you're like, hang on, I know I checked it, and you then check it, uncheck it, check it, uncheck it, don't. Just leave it alone, it'll crop up shortly. So simple way of adding them in. Sorry, say again? Yeah, it's a timer in the background. So it's just that so many people then, by the time it gets around to it, they've already unchecked them again. So just check them, step away from the console, and then wait for it to appear. So that's a very simple one. If I just do a search here for everything, so I'm going to do algorithms, can I spell? Just about. Uh, normal search results page, fortunately connected to the internet here. All I've done is added in the federated search connector onto the standard search results page. Simple little thing, but for so many organisations, stops people from stepping out to go and do an internet search. Because people are often searching both. They'll search their internet, and then they'll go and search externally. I'm confident of this fact, because every organisation I've gone into to review their search architectures, if I look at their usage statistics, the number one search phrase on their internet search is Google. I, I'm mystified as to why. I don't understand why you need to type in Google into your search box to get uh, no results because, you know, so many people add it to their internal search to then open up a browser window because, hang on, it's high. It's, there's G, O. I mean, it's not a hard word to spell, but for whatever reason, I see it all the time. People seem to expect Google to magically appear internally. Drop federated results down the side and you give them the results at the same time. Job done. You've saved at least a few seconds. I have to admit, I quickly provisioned this last night. I brought a, a demo back to live. I cheat and I actually replace the Bing. I either type Google, even though it's not, <laughs> because people never notice the difference. Or normally, I'm a bit more honest, I put internet search. Because people get very wedded. Well, I don't want to use Bing. I want to use Google. Don't have a debate about it. They're internet search engines. You know, get your search results back. Because trust me, when it comes to the first three to six, there's never that big a difference. But bringing them in alongside... A, saves time and keeps them inside the SharePoint environment. Very simple way of doing it. But you can also do that personalised search. If I go to the Teams, I'm going to go down and look at into information technology. And we've got the IT team site. We've got a little bit of a, a welcome saying where you're going to go next. But what I've actually done is made the team site homepage a search page for them so that they can actually search within the context of IT. So now if I type algorithm here, if I can spell... I'm searching, you can see to the left, I've got a display group that's defaulting to information technology. It's only going to search within the information technology sites. So that's good for starters. But if I hit search, there we go. I've got, oh, massive three results. But then down the side, I'm IT, I'm a geek. I've got my MSDN results appearing alongside. And if I scroll down, because it's just come off the resolution, I've got TechNet results appearing alongside. So again, now I've instantly brought a bit more information into IT's environment without needing to mess around with the company intranet and the index. Because you don't need to index MSDN, you know, let it index itself. You just want the search results, fed them in alongside. And to show you how to set that up, I'm going to set one up from scratch. Let me just see how we're going for time. Yeah, we're good for time. And the media. Media is, in fact, a completely blank site. I created it last night, so we can do this as from scratch. If I go into the page... Drop the page into edit mode. I wasn't kidding, it really is a blank page. There's nothing hiding in the background. I need to add a ton of web parts. Click add web part. If you scroll down, you'll get to all your search ones because they're bucketed together. Here we go. 
And what I want is, for starters, I want a search box. That would help. I want the results. That definitely helps. I'll drop the action links because that's the one that will do did you mean if somebody spells incorrectly. Paging comes in handy if there's more of the results than one page can display. Search statistics, everyone likes search statistics. There are other ones here too. I could drop in the best bets feature, but that will do for a starters, I think. Throw them all on the page, and now I just need to layer them out a bit more tidily. So I'm going to drop paging at the bottom. I'm going to put core results above it. Statistics can go there. That can go under there. There we go. And I actually want paging at the top as well. So I'm just going to throw a second paging web part in. Okay, now I need to configure this. So first thing is I've got the standard drop down. It's the default one that I'm seeing. So I want one for media. I'm not sure if I've actually created that. So let's just be fairly organized and check the page in. I'm going to go up to the top of the site collection, back into that search area, into search scopes. And let me just check. No, I haven't. So I'm going to create a new display group. Call it media. And I'm going to use the media scope, which is the scope for all the sites that then get created under media. That's all I need. Don't want the other ones. Click OK. Let's see. Yep, there we go. It's ready. The world is happy. Now I'm going to go back to media, edit my page. I'm now going to modify this web part. Bring up the task pane. The first thing I'm going to do is change my scopes drop down because it will default. And you have to excuse me, I'm going to scroll backwards and forwards a little bit here because of the resolution. If I bring that arrow down, I'm actually going to say show, but do not include contextual scopes. I, it's a personal preference. When it includes contextual, it includes that dynamic scope that you get in SharePoint, which shows this site, colon, and then in the name of the site you're currently on. I take it off because I want all the sites below it automatically. It, it defaults to that one if you switch it on, and then people go, I didn't find the results. And it's because you only searched within one site. You didn't search within all. So simple little thing. I say do not include the contextual scopes. It avoids that confusion. The other settings, pretty much all under miscellaneous. Under miscellaneous, and I can choose if I want the advanced search to show or not. But the most important thing is I actually want the results page to be the same page. I want them to stay here. So by default, it will give you a weird, wacky, it's not weird or wacky at all, quite frankly. It's a box standard results page that SharePoint will generate for you. I'm putting the web parts on this page. So I'm just going to go up to the browser, copy, and I'm going to replace. I could do it properly by bringing up the box. Get rid of the layouts one and put this page in. And then the last thing I need to do is this display group search drop down is that default one. So I called my media. I want to change it to media. If I click apply, and hopefully it should all be fine and dandy. There we go. I've now got my media. Don't worry that you see two, it's a little foible while the page is in edit mode. If we just publish the page, there we go. Media. So now if I do a test, I get no results whatsoever within the media because I'm surprised because there's absolutely no content in the media. But I'm in the same page and I'm now searching just within media. So I've got a context here if I'm a media person. But now we can throw some federated parts on the page as well. So I'm going to drop the page in edit mode. I'm going to spew, technical term, all my federated parts down the right-hand side. And I'm going to do it the laser. I'm just going to keep adding it in here. So let's drop one in. Do it in the gallery, but it's as quick here. And another one. And uh, let's throw a third one in. You can see it's automatically bringing the results back. So again, it's preset to the default federated location with internet search, which is Bing. So I'm going to take my first one, modify it. And it'll show me all the federated locations I've got installed. I've already pre-installed a list. I'll show you those in a moment in the background. But here's the list. So we've got internet search, defaulting, some suggestions, which gives you a little bit of taxonomy, which is quite nice. Go away, restart. We've also got now Flickr, Google News, MSDN, Technet. You can see where those two came from. We've got the register, if you want to see what the gossip is, Wired, and YouTube. So this is a media site. News is going to come in handy. So the first one will make news. You can tweak how it displays, and this is actually very useful to do this because otherwise it takes up a lot of space. 
By default, it will only bring you three results back and then you'll get a more button. If I scroll down here, there you go, you can see more results. Clicking on that will take you out. It'll take you out to their site where all the results are displayed. So if you want to try and keep them in your site, you can just increase this and say, actually, we'll have six results. Should be, if it's not in the first six, well, then we need to go search the internet. Characters in the summary determines how much information appears there, that text under the results title. 300 characters is actually quite a lot. You can take this, you can halve this and still provide sufficient information. So we'll take it down to 50 and ditto for the URL. Click apply. And there we go, Google News. We've got four results and you can see 150 characters is still ample for the descriptions. It really needs to go above that. So we'll take the second one and we'll just repeat the process. And this time we'll, we'll take Flickr. I don't know what will come back from the test. I should warn you in advance, it really is Flickr. I take no responsibility for any images that appear as a result of this demo. <laughs> Thank you very much. So display, we'll put six on because they should tile. Uh, characters in the summary doesn't really matter for Flickr. They're pictures, not words. And if we scroll down, there we go. Oh, look, that was, it's a shoe. It's another shoe. Okay, I don't know why people put shoes in as tests, but there you go. And then finally, we'll do the third one. And what else should we put? Uh, let's use what? Oh, let's do, oh, could be really risky to put YouTube on there, but what the heck, it's the morning. Could have a bit of fun. Let's see what goes through. <coughs> okay, I'm not sure I should keep YouTube on there, but too late, camera's recording. So there we go, three set federated results. We can put a little title and say, hi, this is the media area of the internet. Be warned. Click publish. And there we go, we're all set up. We've got Google News, we've got Flickr, we've got YouTube. If we now do, I don't know. Where this can be useful from a media perspective, you can't be, quite frankly, searching for your own company name. So all what's topical in the news, so I can't resist. We might as well see what's going on with the volcano. Nothing internally, as we'd expect. There we go, oh, yeah, mm -hmm. CNN, it's made CNN. It's, it's frightening. It must be bad if something in Europe makes CNN. <laughs> God, we'll take that out of the film. Uh, we've got more on the Ash Cloud. Uh, unsurprisingly, we've got some, wow, quite fantastic Flickr results. And we've got news clippings. Obviously, people are dropping on YouTube various clippings about the news coverage. So very quick, very real time. I mean, other federated searches I find very useful for media side, for communications. Things like Twitter. You can actually have Twitter federated in, which is very, very interesting, uh, particularly for brand companies, because, you know, put your name in with love or hate, and it frightens people, because they just don't realise that stuff's out there. They Google it, and it won't appear. It'll never appear on the first 20 pages of Google. But if you do a federated result from just Twitter or just Facebook or and all of these different sites now ad adopting the open search standard, if they adopt the open search standard, they can be federated. Very, very powerful. And it's quite interesting to get that real-time updates. So that was federated search. Just to show you how that works in the background, let's just switch over to central admin. Now, this infrastructure update, given that a few of you haven't seen Federated Search, you'll know if you've got it, if you're going to shared services of SharePoint, you'll either have just two options, search settings, search usage reports, or you'll have that third one. If you've got search administration, you're running the infrastructure update, so you've got the Federated Search capabilities. The world is happy. If you haven't, download it. Start. Yeah, question? No, good. Well, the federated search, it depends if it's got anything to do with the application. If you want to have a federated search from that application, then you'll need to set up the authentication mechanisms for it in the background. In fact, let me, I'll bring that up. I think that might be what you mean. Same, similar to the indexing process. You can index secured sites with HTTPS, but you need to configure the certificate so that the indexer can get in and do the indexing process. So it's, it's in a depends answer, but if you can get to it in a browser, you can usually get the indexer to get to it as well. Where it can get tricky is if you need to control who can then leverage that search. I'll show you the interface because there are ways to, to do it. Let's bring it up. If you're hearing my necklace, I have to say, every time I sit up and down, it's on the microphone. So if we're going to search administration, this is just a very new look. If you haven't seen this before, I'll just go back one. The old style 
is under search settings. And it's still still there. So if that looks very familiar to you, if you administer SharePoint, that is the older style search. Part of the reason for bringing the new one in is because there's actually a few other search settings tucked away under the application administration space where you can set up crawl and proxy rules. It's a little bit confusing, so they're all together under search administration. And this UI, although it's a little bit slicker in 2010, but the principles have followed through. So the same options are down the sidebar on the left. I'm going to dive straight into the federated locations if you have the question. In terms of federated locations, you can import them or you can create them your own. And creating your own, if we just click a new location, just requires you to do different parameters. Give it a name and a display name, that's all fairly logical. But you then just have to put the triggers in, which is just, and there's instructions down the left-hand side here. Time won't allow me to go through all of these, but trust me, just read them because they're pretty clear. If you put things in the right curly brackets with the right terms, if it's open search, it'll come back. Uh, I've done it for Twitter a few times, so it's pretty straightforward. And I don't write code, so it's good. You've got two types of locations, search on this server and open search. The search index on this server just simply means you're going to do a federation against your own index. Now, that may sound a little bit odd because you've already got indexing and you can search. There is actually some scenarios where it's useful. If you are indexing a very, very broad set of content internally, you can have generic results in the main page, but you can actually use the federated to return scopes back at the same time. So, for example, if everybody searches IT all the time, if they hit the main search centre, you could actually have the federated connector configured for the search scope for IT. Type in the search, main results are the same, search scopes come along, down, alongside on the right. So, again, it can be a time saver. Sounds a bit of an unusual one, but it's actually quite useful to use the same federated capabilities against your own index. You've got our query template. I'll not go through too much detail here. Uh, to answer your question, right down at the bottom, we've got some of the credentials here. And that includes who can use the search, too. So you can actually control it. So things that are secured may also have limited access. So you can put the configure uh, and define the authentication there. So there are different settings for the federated. How accurate for actual applications is going to depend to some degree on the application. But it can certainly go through HTTPS to websites. So in theory, it should be doable for an app, too. Other settings, just to, to make you aware of, that are all down here, this side too, we have the scopes. So here are my scopes that I've set up. They're all very, very simple. If I just look at my information technology one, into the rules, here's my scope. I've got just one rule which points to the correct URL. So if I just click on that, you can just see the settings here. All that scope is is web address, taking it down the site hierarchy through Teams to IT, which means anything after that is part of this scope. Really very basic, very simple scope. Scopes can be very, very granular. You can see we've got here, we can do content source, which is this, the source being indexed. We can do everything. We can also do property query. That's where those managed properties can come in handy because you can actually create a scope then that only returns results that match values within a specific property query. So you can take it right down to a very granular level. You can include, you can require, and you can exclude content. And again, that exclude, people say, well, what's the point of having an exclude? It can be quite useful because you can actually take content out of your standard results if they're noisy, like that community of practice. If you've got a, a very, very chatty community or distributionist where people just share stuff, sell stuff, you know, it's all about interest outside of work, but it probably still wants to be indexed. It just doesn't want to be part of the main index because it's not really the work that people are doing in, the, in their typical day job. Set up a rule to exclude it out of the core index and then have a separate scope. So when you're on the community page, you search within the community area. But all that noise, all that, you know, oh, I'm selling my car, does anyone want a car? You know, I'm selling my barbecue set. If you've got that kind of chatty discussion, that result does not need to clutter up a working index. So actually exclude it from the core index, have a separate scope, and drop that scope on the community area. It all helps get the results down to the right set. A couple of other tricks in here. Authoritative pages. If you haven't seen this before, authoritative pages are quite interesting. It defaults to the root, your internet root, and says, well, this is the start of your site hierarchy, your site collection, so it's got to be the authority. It's where everybody goes to begin. Windows, give me 30 minutes at least. So that's the standard URL, and that will determine part of that URL depth algorithm. You can overcome some of the URL depth issues by defining authoritative sites. 
So if you've got a, a knowledge system or a record system that's actually crucial to the organisation, it contains the guts of knowledge that's reused on a regular basis, it might not be at the top hierarchy, it might be buried under a couple of levels, you can actually add it here and say that's actually our authority, that's where our good stuff is and it can overcome that URL depth issue because now it promotes that and says oh we'll count from this location, this is our most authoritative location. But equally down at the bottom, you can demote locations too. This is an alternative from the community side. If you don't want to exclude the community content completely because if people search for the right terms, they'll find what they need, simply demote it. If it's sitting off the top level intranet and so it's very high up in that URL depth, it's going to dominate the results. Push it down. If you put it in here, it, I don't have the exact percentages, but just either promoting or demoting just lowers the rank. It just recalculates the rank and dulls it and takes it out of the priority. So, simple, simple tricks. If you are doing your managed properties, they're all under metadata properties here. We'll just quickly look at one. Most of these are exactly as they're configured out of the box. And we can see a couple. Let me just not have one of tool tip. So, if we see this one, uh, let's take uh, what have we got with a couple, not the very first one, about me. You can see it's got a couple of different fields, and they're just two different crawled properties. One's from in the My Site profiles, and one's actually from direct from notes fields inside of SharePoint sites. To add to them, you just hover over, edit the property, and you can see here include values from all, include from a single, and you can add the mappings in. And when you click Add Mapping, this is one cheaty way of finding out what crawled properties you've got, because here they all are. They're all listed under mappings, and they go on forever. And you think this is a vanilla install of SharePoint with about 100 documents in four sites, with no extra columns, because I haven't created them yet. And this is a lot of default properties. You can filter straight down to get to your SharePoint columns. They'll all start with an OWS underscore. So if I decide to actually keyword matches, Add it in, and now all those three are listed a part of the managed property that is about me. If I do a search and want to match to the about me field, it'll also query these other crawled properties as well, so you can cluster related terms. The important box to be aware of, if you do want to use them in scopes, is do make sure you check that box at the end, because that allows them. If you don't check the box, they won't be available to select inside the scopes area. So it's just a simple gotcha that a lot of people miss. Okay, other quick tips on where search can go wrong, just to get towards the end. The other area are the file types. Here, I've just clicked through into manage file types, because it's another little thing. It's not particularly well documented, and not everybody knows. This list of file types, and again, all bar one, PDF, of these are listed as you install. PDF is Adobe, you have to add it in. It's quite important to add it in, because when SharePoint indexes, it crawls, it crawls sites, it crawls file shares, it crawls applications, it just crawls stuff. What it's looking for are objects to index, and based on their extension, determines whether it indexes them or not. So even if you've got documents that are readable, completely readable by the crawler, if its extension isn't on this list, it will ignore it. It's one of the easy gotchas where people say, oh, we've got content and I'm not finding it. It's because for whatever user, they've got a website or a web content management system where you can put your own extensions on for for news and what have you, if it's not listed, even though it could be indexed or the technology is there to do it, it won't. Simple as that, just by not being listed in the file type. It's just one of those silly gotchas that if you don't realize, can be very frustrating to figure out what's not working. Okay, that's been a little bit of a whistle-stop tour. I mean, this workshop used to be about a five, six-hour workshop in a day, and I've just tried to pull some of the pertinent points back today because I do still see these same issues through an awful lot of search deployments. So to just recap, internal search, it is very, very different to internet search. You know, the behaviours that are driven to search and the outcomes from searching, very, very different. When people ask you, why can't I have Google? Tell them, tell them honestly, you know, it's different, explain the context. However, the behavior trends are identical. You know, it's the same thing. We're starting to see the same on the internet. If you haven't noticed, 
Google, Bing, all the different search engines, you're seeing increasing amounts of metadata start to appear down the sides to filter. Oh, you've typed in about uh, a local destination. You probably want maps. Do you want travel guides? You're starting to get prompts to refine the search. That behavior, very, very similar internally and externally. SharePoint 2007 has technical limitations, and that indexing server is the ultimate bottleneck, and it is a bottleneck in terms of the time to index content. I've got at least one client where we just can't, because I calculated it takes 67 days to build the index, and we can't shut the, <laughs> shut the server network out whilst we do that, so we'll, it's going to go straight on to 2010. It is a limitation, but, and it's a big but, Tweaking the features can make a huge difference. Ah, one other thing I didn't show, and I'll just quickly show you on that, because it's worth it again. It's one that a lot of people don't realize. If you go to your site, by default, as you create things, everything's indexed by default. If you've got content that doesn't need to be indexed, just say don't index it. And the easiest way to do that is if you go into the site settings, you'll have search visibility. This option is on all the site settings. It's also on all of the list and library settings. If you've got sites, I mean, things like capturing people's vacation days or who's on duty on the help desk system, it's information captured in a list. It's useful. Does it need to be indexed? Does it really need to occupy time on that indexing server? Possibly not. Switch it to no. Just take it out. It doesn't have to be in there. Not everything has to be found in the index. And if you can lower the volume of noisy information, unessential information, that can make a huge difference to the volume of content you actually need to index. So there's, a, there's one other thing to quickly uh, show. The big difference coming down the line with SharePoint 2010 really is the scale. I mean, I, I, I get all oh, giddy, not that giddy, but I do get quite excited. The, the ability to partition can make a phenomenal difference. I mean, there are two features from a scale perspective if you're dealing with terabytes of content. There's the ability to use the remote blob storage facility that SQL provides where you can get content out of SQL and onto the file server. And I think there's a session during the conference about that. And there's index partitioning so that you can splat out the indexing process in parallel to go get all this stuff. You know, and to be fair, you know, it sounds like a terrible limitation to SharePoint today, and it is 2007. But as little as three years ago, I, didn't come across, I came across very few clients with terabytes of information. Today, I'm seeing clients grow half a terabyte of new information within six months. The, the, the scale of creating content has grown rapidly in the last 12 to 18 months. So it is really making this limitation an issue. That is overcome, and it's those new features to assist the behavior to that managed metadata bringing it down. But the final, final point is to think about search. It doesn't have to be a one-size-fits-all. It doesn't have to be one search box and one results page. People work in different areas of the internet. They may be forced to start at the home page by group policy and then they have to navigate to where they're going, but they will spend their time in their working areas. Bring search to them, give them a targeted search, and you can overcome a lot of the relevance issues that they're experiencing. With that, oh, it's quarter two. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming for the first session of the day. Much appreciated. Hope it's been useful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we have one already. No, dive in. Yeah, where you can add to the managed properties there. You can, the scopes can be added in there as well. So you can actually have people selecting their scopes. It's easy to add the property. The problem you've got is what the user then types in for the value. Because the XML to add the managed properties into the drop down list to select, so select author or select document class of category or select project name, that bit's fine. But they've then physically got a type of value in to match. And it's, it's got to be an exact match. It's not wildcard by default. Most organizations that want managed metadata search in the advanced fields want a second drop-down list that says, I select project, now filter it and let them be able to select from a list of projects to search from. Beautiful concept, but that's the bit that's very tricky to do. It means you have to code that solution. So the drop-down list is 
Use the scopes, yeah, because then you can preset them. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much.